Um, welcome to our presentation on um, trustless validator pools in ETH 2.0. Um, I'm Dankrat Feist, and this is my colleague uh, Karl Beekhuisen. We are both um, researchers in the ETH 2.0 research team, and um, we'd like uh, to talk a bit about um, our uh, efforts to make uh, trustless staking uh, possible in ETH 2.0, why we're doing this, what we, how we designed the protocol to make this possible, and then in the end, like, uh, Carl will uh, talk about um, the actual yeah, implementation of this, how, how it would work. So yeah, this is the outline of the talk. So like motivation, why, why do we need trustless staking pools? Why, why we want this as a, a primary goal in ETH 2.0? Um, then like how do you design um, a protocol? So like the technology basically that um, is needed to have trustless staking pool as uh, secure multi-party computations. Um, and then uh, there are basically um, less and more advanced ways to have these trustless staking pools. You can have a basic algorithm that enables you to have um, a sort of trustless staking, um, or you can actually, if, if you want, um, extend this uh, to also have fault attribution so that um, if you're um, honest two-thirds majority assumption fails, uh, you can still, um, yeah, with very high likelihood, uh, not lose your money if you're in such a pool. Okay, so um, what's so cool? Why, why do we need um, uh, trustless staking pools? So like the first thing you have to know about uh, proof of stake, like in ETH 2.0, um, we need to fix um, the, the, the amount that is staked by every valid validator to roughly the same amount. And, and why is that? It's very difficult to de design a protocol that works with, uh, fair, in a fair way with, with vastly different uh, stakes. So for example, when you sample uh, people for committees, um, you don't make any adjustments for their stake because it would just be too, be too complex. And so like the protocol is designed so that um, it only really works if what everyone has staked is roughly similar. It can vary slightly, but if it varies too much, then like the assumptions will fail. And um, so like the, the amount that we agreed on is 32 ETH, which is like in today's price is about 5,500 US dollars. But say like one ETH goes to 10,000 US dollars, which is very well possible from what we know, um, then once one uh, validator would have to stake 32,000 uh, 322, 320,000 ETH, uh, sorry, US dollars, um, which is great for security because then suddenly we would have um, like our security assumption and proof of stake of course depend on how much money is staked by the validators overall, um, but it would increase the barrier of entry uh, to such a high amount that like um, very few people could actually um, afford becoming a validator uh, from the capital cost point of view. And so um, that would not be what we're aiming for to just make validating another easy income stream for the rich that's not accessible for everyone else. And um, since, um, as I mentioned before, it's not really an option to just make staking possible with any um, staking amount, the alternative is that we create staking pools where several people can come together and say like we want to run one, one validator together and we'll put, um, everyone puts in part of the required capital. And so, um, and the nice thing about when you have trustless staking pools, as we're going to talk about in this presentation, then um, they can still be decentralized. So like having a pool doesn't mean, oh, um, I know like Jeff is like a trustworthy guy, we'll just everyone give him their money and he'll run it. Uh, but no, we can actually do this so that everyone runs that validator together um, in a multi-party computation, and um, you don't need to uh, fully trust that any of the guys um, is like completely trustworthy. Right, um, and there's actually also a second very good reason to do this, um, which is that e even, if, uh, even if you are a single guy putting up uh, the deposit, um, you might not actually want to run your validator on just one machine, because the thing is to run the validator, you need to have the validator secret on that machine. And that's, um, of course, a huge potential security risk because someone hacking that machine could just do whatever they want uh, with that um, key and potentially get you slashed. So a nice thing is if you have 
the technology to enable multi-party computation for validators, then that also means you can increase your security um, by distributing your key across, say, just three machines um, and say, like, you don't, you want to run it in the cloud, you don't fully trust your cloud provider, you can have one on Azure, one on S3, and one on the Google Cloud. So um, you avoid having a single point of failure. Cool, so uh, let's come um, to the uh, technology that, um, that makes this possible. So one thing is that um, we chose um, to, in order to sign anything on ETH2, um, we chose this um, signature scheme that's uh, called uh, BLS signatures. And uh, basically the way it works um, is that it uses um, an elliptic group with a pairing. So what that means is that um, you have this uh, pairing uh, function. Sorry, this okay. So um, E that pairs uh, two elements uh, from elliptic groups um, with this uh, linearity relation. So like um, you can move this factor n from the from the first argument to the second argument, um, and you can also move it out um, of the sorry out of the pairing here. Um, and so like um, a secret key um, is just an integer, and a public key is you, mu you multiply your generator, which is a G1, uh, by your secret key. And in order to sign a message, uh, you multiply that message, so that's a point, you remap the message to a point in the elliptic group, um, to your secret key times M. And in order to check it, you use the pairing equation. Um, so you, you check that um, the pairing of your public key and uh, the message is the same as the generate and the generator and the signature. And um, the amazing thing about the signature scheme is that um, if you look at the signature checking equation here, um, it's linear in the public key and the signature. Um, and this means that um, you can uh, you can do something like you can you can add two public keys and two signatures, and um, and that will still be a valid signature for the sum of these two public keys and that message. So basically, like you can uh, you can just add signatures um, in order to create a new aggregated signatures, and uh, this is amazing. And basically, it also enables um, kind of many things that we do in ETH2 in the first place, or in a way. It enables sharding in the first place because it means that thousands of signatures can just be aggregated into one single signature that, um, that can be checked once using this pairing and you know that everyone has signed this correctly. So this saves a huge amount of data and computation. Um, but also um, at the same time, uh, since it is linear, this uh, enables something uh, called uh, Shamir secret sharing. So um, the idea behind uh, Shamir secret sharing is like, set, let's say we have 10 parties who want to um, share a secret. What we do is um, we, make, we make the secret a number and um, we encode it by creating a polynomial that um, at zero has evaluates to that number. And we give every one of those 10 parties, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, one point on that polynomial. And then, uh, and now the degree of that polynomial determines how many of the parties you need in order to reconstruct uh, the secret. So for example, here, I've chosen a polynomial of degree three. And we know that any polynomial of degree three can be, uh, can be reconstructed using four values. And so that means, this um, automatically gives, you, gives us a four out of 10 signature scheme. That means you need uh, four of the people and any four, no matter which four, could uh, recreate that point at zero. And, um, and basically due to the linearity of the BLS signature scheme, that means we automatically have the signature, the threshold signature scheme. Um, and that means that um, we can design this M out of N scheme. Um, and yeah, yeah. So basically, that gives us threshold BLS signature, which is like the, the most important ingredient because most of the work that you do as a validator is signing things like attesting blocks, <laughs> saying this was a correct block, 
this is the state of that shard at that block, and now we can do that in, um, in a decentralized way. Right. Um, and now, um, coming to one uh, point that was um, th kind of difficult in this, um, is we have, we have one element of the protocol um, that inherently needs um, a more, uh, yeah, a computation that involves your secret that cannot be solved using these aggregate signatures. And that's the so-called called proof of custody. What's the proof of custody? Um, the idea behind the proof of custody is that um, you want to prove uh, ownership um, of data. So what, you, what we want to do is that when you sign that you have seen a certain uh, amount of shard data, that you also prove that you have seen that data. Because otherwise, you have this so-called lazy validator problem that means that, um, oh, like, I've seen some signatures for this data, so probably it's fine. I'll just sign it without doing the work. And that's probably OK 99% of the time. But in the 1% of the time where you do have an attacker and that, who does something really evil, um, they could, could use those validators, the, those lazy validators, to massively amplify their attack. Because they only need a small number of signatures of some data, for example, that's not available at all. And, um, and then all those lazy validators would sign it. And um, suddenly, you have like this non-available data that's signed off, which is a massive problem for the chain. Um, so the way we avoid this is by having every validator, whenever they sign that chart data, um, generate one extra bit, the so-called custody bit or custody root. And, um, and that's basically a mix of um, a secret. Um, it's uh, the secret here and the data at every data block. And then you basically, so this is the original construction. This is good for like understanding how it works. You compute a kind of hash tree root of this whole thing, and then you take the first bit of the root. Okay, and basically only if you have that secret you can compute it. If you don't have it, you can't compute it. Someone else can't easily compute it for you unless they have that secret. And if you give away the, that secret, then we can slash you. So um, that gives you a very strong incentive of actually getting the data because if you don't have it, it's very likely that your custody bit is going to be wrong. Um, now the problem with this is how do you do that if you are in, um, in a validator pool, if you don't actually want anyone to have the secret that can get everyone slashed. Like it would be a massive problem if someone needs to have this whole secret. Um, and the way um, you, uh, yeah, okay, so there's a summary. Um, yeah. Um, so the way we solved that problem is um, we found um, this uh, new uh, pseudo-random function um, that basically um, is very friendly to compute in a multi-party computation so that you can compute um, with many participants um, uh, in, a, in a very efficient way as defined um, as using the so-called Legendre symbol. Um, which is that which is defined by uh, so this is like it's the notation is a over p and it's one if a is a quadratic residue modulo p so if there's a number that squares to a modulo p minus one if it's not and then there's a special case that it's zero if p divides a but in a way you could say that never happens because the pre prime we're using is so crazy big that this is like um, yeah, this is like a zero hash or something. It just doesn't happen. Um, we normalize this to a bit because one, one and minus one are not really like a nice thing to work when, with in a protocol. Um, and then the PRF um, is defined by just computing um, this Legendre bit of the sum of the secret and the data. Um, and the nice thing is that this is super easy to compute in a multi-party computation. Um, I'll not go over that um, in detail right now because the time for that is a bit short. Uh, but basically, um, there's a nice way to just blind the whole thing. And um, be, when it's blinded, like you can, you can do the actual computation in the open, and then it's very easy to reconstruct the original result um, from that. Um, yeah, and then basically we replace, can replace the proof of custody using this pseudo-random function. 
Um, and that gives us an MPC-friendly proof of custody um, protocol. Um, yeah, so like, I've been working on this Legendre function for a while now because we really want to use it. The only problem with it at the moment is that um, it hasn't had a terrible amount of crypt analysis, um, and so we're currently uh, working on improving that. Um, so one thing I wanted to mention here is like, um, we set those uh, bounties on like um, improving the state. So like uh, we have uh, both uh, uh, like asymptotic bounties for finding any better <coughs> algorithms um, and uh, some concrete ones. There will soon be a smart contract for resolving these. So uh, stay tuned. But you can already um, on legendrepif.org slash bounties can already go get those challenges. If you find a solution, just email me and then uh, you can also already claim them. Um, yeah, so basically you can uh, win between uh, 1 and uh, 16 ETH uh, for finding um, basically uh, yeah, keys uh, for Legendre um, in different instances. Um, the smallest ones are designed so that like with a few months or so of compute time you can actually solve them. So I'm expecting them to be solved, but would be really interested in how long it actually takes. Uh, the most difficult ones ho hopefully no one can ever solve, but um, yeah, we want to know if there are any algorithmic improvements that might change this. Cool. Yeah, with this, I'll hand over to Carl. Cool. So uh, moving on as to how we actually uh, apply this. Uh, this is going to be a bit fast due to time constraints, but uh, here we go. Um, so there's a distinction to make here quickly between um, two ways of constructing pools. One is where um, you try use, uh, you, you, you use economic incentives and uh, custodial relationships to, 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 to manage a pool. Uh, which is more like the case of, of, of Rocket Pool, whereas this is more designed to be run in an MPC where you want to be involved in the, the pooling structure. So you don't want to hand your, your, your Ether over to a pool, even if they are incentivized. So these are what you are required to do as a validator within ETH 2.0. These are the, the primary responsibilities with their frequencies. Um, and all of this is relatively uh, cheap in terms of, of, of what needs to be done. Um, and as you can see, things like the MPC uh, calculator Legendre shows up uh, once an epoch. Um, and so these kinds of things are, are, are uh, enabled by the, what Dunkrod presented. Um, let's skip over that. Um, so the obvious way to do this would be something like PBFT consensus for a pool because we need a system that is uh, safe but not live because if you ever commit something that is not not uh, a, a supermajority of your nodes agree with, then you've run into the scenario where you can get your pool slashed. Um, a relatively easy way of uh, achieving this is actually just using the VLS signatures. So you set your threshold as two thirds of your pool size. And um, ba based on this, uh, if you have to propose, one of the pool members proposes, um, but otherwise, you see what your attestation duties are. This is available if you have a view of the chain. Uh, you compute the appropriate custody bit, and you sign an attestation um, only if this attestation you think is valid in your local view. And this is with basically the overhead of only BLS signatures plus the custody bits that Dunkrod presented earlier um, allows you to have uh, pooling, which is very cool. Um, unfortunately, that doesn't guarantee consistency. Uh, because it's not a full consensus protocol, people can disagree as to the state of um, what the chain is at any given time. Uh, so basically, you can have some structure that runs PBFT if you run into some unhappy case where the pool gets out of sync. Um, you can also make this slightly more interesting, which is where you have some kind of meta pool, which exists between the pools. So as a pool member, you don't only participate in your pool, but you participate in this, this, this larger meta pool. And this allows you to use the meta pool to have fault attribution, where you prove to the rest of the pool that uh, this meta pool that someone did something bad in your pool. And then if one of your pool members got you slashed, uh, got, got your pool slashed, you can, the, because the slash is not burning all of the ether, it's only burning a portion, you can basically take all of that, the, the, the negative uh, penalty, and put it on that one person who is bad and give the other people um, the, their money back. Uh, and in fact, it may, it may turn out that uh, you can get more money out. So you may make a profit if one of your pool members gets slashed, which is uh, pretty cool. It depends on exactly how you construct it. 
So yeah, that's uh, the uh, basic construction and uh, how something like this would work within ETH 2.0.